The market cap of cryptocurrencies reach one trillion dollar. The underlying technology blockchain is going to revolutionize finance as well as many other industries. It's going to be bigger than the internet revolution. If you are an investor, an entrepreneur or a developer, you need to understand blockchain. In this video, I will explain what are cryptocurrencies, what is blockchain and I will give specific use cases for many different industries. If you don't know me, I'm Julian, ex finance guy. I've been working in blockchain full time since 2017 and on my channel Eat the Blocks, I explain blockchain technology. A lot of people confuse cryptocurrencies with blockchain, but they are two different concepts. Blockchain is a technology. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Litecoin are digital currencies. These digital currencies make use of the blockchain technology, but the use case of blockchain is not limited to cryptocurrencies. It can also be used to build advanced financial applications, games, etc. The first cryptocurrency that was created was Bitcoin. That's also the cryptocurrency that created the blockchain technology. Other cryptocurrencies like Litecoin or Ethereum each have their own separate blockchain. For example, if you transfer one Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain, it has absolutely no effect on the Ethereum blockchain. A very important question is how the price of cryptocurrencies is determined. Let's say you have one Bitcoin and you want to sell it. I have some money and I want to buy your Bitcoin. We meet somewhere, I give you the money and you give me the Bitcoin. How much money should I give you? For reference, we will probably use the current price of a Bitcoin at some big exchanges like Coinbase. In these exchanges, there are buyers and sellers of Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin will depend on supply and demand. The more buyers relatively to sellers, the higher the price of Bitcoin. Conversely, the more sellers relatively to buyers, the lower the price of Bitcoin. What is important to understand is that the Bitcoin blockchain does not care about the price of Bitcoin. It only cares about who owns what. If you send your Bitcoin to another address, your Bitcoin will change ownership regardless of whether or not you actually receive some money in exchange for these Bitcoins. Another important aspect of Bitcoin pricing is the limited number of coins. There are 21 millions of Bitcoins total. That's very different from normal money where the central bank just keep printing new coins. The built-in supply limit of Bitcoin is one of the key reasons why investors think that Bitcoin is valuable. Next, let's understand how the blockchain works. There are many different kind of blockchain technology, but since blockchain was created by Bitcoin, I'm going to explain the Bitcoin blockchain. Other blockchains reuse the same principles. The blockchain is a database storing transactions. Transactions tell you how much Bitcoin was transferred from one address to another. In blockchain, an address is similar to your bank account number. Transactions are organized in blocks. Beside transactions, each block contains cryptographic hashes. A hash is a cryptographic signature of data. It's used to make sure that data hasn't been tampered with. You can go from the data to the hash very easily, but it's almost impossible to go from the hash to the data. If you change just one bit of the data, the resulting hash will be totally different. Each block contains a hash of its own transactions and the hash of the previous block. This way, the blocks are related to each other. The transactions inside a block are never modified. Instead, we add new blocks on top of the previous ones for future transactions. Adding a new block is called mining a transaction and it's a very important part of the blockchain technology. To understand this, we need to first talk of the Bitcoin network. The blockchain is stored on many computers across the world. Each of these blockchain copies is called a node. We estimate that there are about 10,000 Bitcoin nodes in the world. Most of these nodes are miners. Miners are in constant competition to add the next block to the blockchain. They constantly listen to new transactions coming from users of the Bitcoin blockchain. When they have enough pending transactions, they try to solve a mathematical puzzle. If they are the first one to solve this mathematical puzzle, they earn money with the transaction fees. Each transaction needs to pay miners for their service. And second, they also earn money with new Bitcoins that are created each block and given as a reward to the winning miner. What is this mathematical puzzle that miners are trying to solve? That's the famous proof of work algorithm. 
miners need to calculate the hash of the block they are trying to mine. In input, they use the data of the block plus an integer called a nonce. The numerical value of the hash needs to be under a certain threshold called the difficulty. This difficulty is recalculated by the blockchain for each block in order to keep the average time between blocks equal to 10 minutes. If the value of the hash is not below the required difficulty, miners need to recalculate a new hash by incrementing the nonce. They repeat the procedure until either they find a hash that is below the required difficulty or another miner finds the correct hash. If the miner finds a hash below the required threshold, he has the right to add the block to the blockchain and makes money with transaction fees and new Bitcoin created for them. But why do we even bother with this cryptographic puzzle? We actually don't care about finding this hash. What we care about is forcing miners to do a calculation computationally difficult which requires them to spend money in order to make sure they have an interest to be honest and only include valid transactions. More on that in the next section. Last aspect of the Bitcoin blockchain is wallets. Wallets are external software. Each user of Bitcoin must have his own wallet. Wallets have two main functions, manage private keys and send transactions. Wallets first create an address by generating a random number. This random number is used to create a private key and an address. You can go from the private key to the address, but not the other way around. The private key must be kept secret in the wallet, but the address is public. When a user wants to send Bitcoin to someone else, the wallet creates a transaction with the recipient, the amount, and the signature. The signature is generated by using the private key related to the address, and it guarantees that the sender really wanted to send this transaction. Okay, so that's it for how the blockchain works. Next, I will show you why the blockchain is secure. First, as a user, how can I be sure that the data coming from the blockchain is true? The best way is to run your own Bitcoin node. That's the software that runs the blockchain. You don't have to be a miner to run this software. It can be used in a read-only mode. When you start your Bitcoin node for the first time, it connects to other Bitcoin nodes in the network and download all the data of the blockchain. It verifies that the transactions inside each block is correct, which means that the sending address needs to have enough Bitcoin and the signature of the transaction must be correct. If any transaction is incorrect in the block, it just drops the current block and wait to receive correct data from all the nodes in the network. Next, how can we be sure that miners will not try to steal your coin? In order to be competitive, miners need to buy a lot of expensive hardware and consume a lot of electricity to successfully mine blocks. All of this costs a lot of money. If a miner tries to include a wrong transaction in the blockchain, for example, by stealing the coins of someone or creating coins out of nowhere, even if this miner managed to solve the mathematical puzzle first, his block will be rejected by other miners and the original miner will have lost a lot of money in electricity without making any gain. In other words, the miner doesn't have any interest to behave in a dishonest way. That's the magic of the proof of work algorithm. What about if a group of malicious miners try to act together to create a fake block and steal some Bitcoin? In order for their attack to be successful, they need to convince more than 50% of the miners of the network to be with them. For big blockchain like Bitcoin, there are many miners and it's almost impossible to do this. And even if they succeeded, they wouldn't be able to sell their Bitcoins for real money in exchanges like Coinbase. Next, how can we be sure that someone will not steal our Bitcoins with a fake transaction? When you send a transaction from your wallet, it contains the detail of your transaction, including the sending address, the recipient address, the amount of Bitcoin you are sending and a cryptographic signature that guarantees that you're actually meant to send this transaction. If anybody try to send Bitcoin on your behalf, they will be unable to produce a valid signature and the Bitcoin network would reject the transaction. Also, when you send a transaction to the Bitcoin network, you don't need to trust anybody in the communication chain. If anybody tries to modify the data of the transaction, like the recipient field, the signature will not match up with the new data and the transaction will be rejected by the network. 
the worst that can happen is that someone in the communication chain decide to drop your transaction. In this case, it's not mine and your transaction never happened. Now that you understand everything about blockchain technology, it's time to see what are its main use cases. The first use case of blockchain is access to banking services. In 2018, according to the World Bank, 1.7 billion people were unbanked. Usually, these are poor people and not getting access to banking services make it even harder for them to escape poverty as they cannot even save money in a secure way. Because the blockchain is permissionless, these people could create a wallet without asking any permission. They could get paid in cryptocurrencies and keep their money safely stored on the blockchain at no cost. All they would need is a smartphone so that they can install a wallet software. That's it. So we haven't seen a lot of real life adoption for this use case yet, but there is really a lot of potential. The next use case of blockchain is foreign remittance. There are many people from developing countries who go to work in rich countries and send back some of their earnings to their families back home. In 2018, according to the World Bank, almost $700 billion were paid to developing countries. To send the money back home, most people use services like Western Union, who charge exorbitant fees of 10% or more to people who are already poor. With blockchain, it costs the same amount to transfer money to someone who is just next to you compared to someone who lives very far away. It also costs the same amount to transfer small or large amount of money, contrary to remittance services who charge a percentage cost. Currently, the transaction fees on Bitcoin is $15 for a transaction because we are in a bull market and the network is very used, but in normal time, it's just a few dollars and other blockchains can be way cheaper than this. The next use case for blockchain is online payments. Even though there are a lot of online payment services, it can be surprisingly difficult to get paid online. A lot of online payment services refuse their service to some businesses, and it's also easy to be blocked for any reason. PayPal, I'm looking at you. If you want to use blockchain to get paid, you don't need anybody's permission. You just create a wallet, you give your wallet address to your customers, they pay you, and that's it. The next use case of blockchain is digital gold. With central banks printing more and more money, the value of fiat currencies keeps going down. Traditionally, gold has been used as a hedge against this inflation risk, but there are a couple of problems with gold. First, there is additional gold mined every year. Second, owning physical gold is not very easy. Third, even if you can buy paper gold, there are some barriers to entry, like creating a brokerage account. With Bitcoin, we are limited to 21 million Bitcoins. This kind of currency has a built-in scarcity, which guarantees its value long-term. On top of it, contrary to physical gold, you don't need to store it somewhere. It doesn't matter that you own one or 100 Bitcoin. It fits in a single wallet. The next use case of blockchain is finance. You want to buy stocks, you need to create an account at a brokerage company and your application can be rejected. You want a loan, you need to apply to a bank and they can be quite picky. You want to raise money for a business ID, you need to present your ID to venture capital companies and only if they like your ID, they will give you access to some capital. For each of these operations, because you need to go through intermediaries, you not only need their permission, but you also need to pay them for their service and they are not cheap. With the blockchain, you cut the middleman. You don't need their permission anymore and you also don't have to pay them. The next use case of blockchain is for governance and elections. Organizing elections can be quite complex and costly. On top of it, after we elect someone, we have no guarantees that this person will actually do the things he promised to do. And finally, the voting process can be quite opaque, which makes some people doubt the result of some elections. With elections on blockchain, we could solve all of these problems. The cost of organizing an election on the blockchain is very low. We can vote directly for some decisions to be taken without any intermediary. And finally, because all of the data is public on the blockchain, it's very easy for everybody to trust the result of the election. Currently, we do see some form of governance on the blockchain with so-called DAO or Decentralized Autonomous Organization. These are entities that vote for the evolution of some blockchain projects. This is quite niche, but I believe that in the future we could have a more widespread adoption of this ID for governance of companies or for voting on local issues like they do in Switzerland with the so-called votations. And maybe one day we will even vote for presidential elections on the blockchain. 
Next use case of the blockchain is for social media. Currently, we have this huge concentration of power for social media companies. They start to have a more and more aggressive attitude to censorship. Today, this censorship is done by social media companies, but tomorrow it could be done by the government as well. With the blockchain, we could have decentralized social media networks where nobody could censor anything. Another use case of blockchain is supply chain. If you buy medicine or some luxury item, you want to be sure that the product you buy is not a counterfeit. We could have a system where each product has a serial number and every time it's sold to someone else, this is reflected on the blockchain. As a buyer, when you buy the product, your wallet will be able to track the origin of the product. So is the blockchain going to solve all of our problems? No, the blockchain is not perfect. The blockchain is very slow. On Bitcoin, it takes 10 minutes to add a new block on average. The blockchain is also very expensive. Every time you want to change data, you need to pay transaction fees. The blockchain also has a very limited capacity because we need to store the same data on many computers. That is what we call the scaling issue and this is an area of active research. But even though there are all of these limitations, blockchain is amazing and is going to impact so many different industries. Bitcoin was just the first blockchain and we can only do simple financial transactions on it. Ethereum is a more modern blockchain that was created to go beyond the limitations of Bitcoin. With Ethereum, we can implement many of the advanced use cases I mentioned before. We can achieve this with small programs that run on the blockchain. That's what we call smart contracts. And these smart contracts are fascinating. They can never be stopped or censored by anybody. And I will explain this in another video on Ethereum. I will see you there.